David Copperfield by Charles Dickens, Chapter 2, I Observe. The first objects that assure a distinct presence before me, as I look back, as I look far back to the blank of my infancy, are my mother with her pretty hair and youthful shape, and Peggotty with no shape at all, and eyes so dark that they seem to darken their whole neighborhood in her, in her, in her face. The cheeks so hard and red that I wondered the birds didn't peck her in preference of ap to apples. Peggotty and I were sitting one night by the parlor fire alone. I had been reading to Peggotty about crocodiles. I must have read very perspicacity. I must have read very perspicuously, or the poor old or the poor soul must have been very deeply interested, for I remember she had a cloudy impression. After I had done that they were a, that they were a sort of vegetable, I was tired of reading and dead sleepy. But having leave as a high treat to sit up until my mother came home from spending the evening at a neighbor's, I would rather have died upon my post, of course, than have gone to bed. Peggotty, I said suddenly, will you ever married? Lord Master Davy, replied Peggotty, what's put marriage in your head? She answered with such a start that it quite awoke me, and then she stooped in her work, or she stopped in her work and looked at me, with her needle drawn out to its thread's length. But were you ever married, Peggotty? says I. You are a very handsome woman, aren't you? Me handsome, Davy, said Peggotty. Lark, no, my dear. You aren't cross, I suppose, Peggotty, are you? I said. She laid aside her work and, opening her arms wide, took my curly head within them and gave it a good squeeze. I know it was a good squeeze because being very plump whenever she made any little exertion after she was dressed, some of the buttons on the back of her gown flew off, and I recollect two bursting to opposite sides of the parlor while she was hugging me. Now let me hear some more about crocodiles said Peggotty, who was not quite who had not quite got the who was not quite right in the name yet. We were exhausted. The crocodile we we had exhausted the crocodiles and begun with the alligators. When the garden bell rang, we went out to the door, and there was my mother looking unusually pretty, I thought. And with her a gentleman with beautiful black hair, whisk and whiskers, who had walked home with us from church last Sunday. As my mother stooped down on the threshold to take me in her arms and kiss me, the gentleman said, I was, more highly I was a more highly privileged little fellow than a monarch, or something like that. For my latter understanding comes. I am sensible to my aid here. What does that mean? I asked him over her shoulder. He patted me on the head, but somehow I didn't like him or his deep voice, and I was jealous that his hand should touch my mother's in touching me, which it did. I put it away as well I could. Oh, Davy, remonstrated my mother. Dear boy, said the gentleman, I cannot wonder at his devotion. I never saw such a beautiful color on my mother's face before. She gently chided me for being rude and keeping me close to her shawl, turned to thank the gentleman for taking so much trouble as to bring her home. She put out her hand to him as she spoke, and as we met it with his own, she glanced. I thought at me. Let us say good bye. Let us say good night, my fine boy," said the gentleman, when he had bent his head. I saw him over my mother's little glove. Good night," said I. "Come, let us be the best friends in the world," said the gentleman, laughing. "Shake hands." My right hand was in my mother's left, so I gave him the other. "Why, that's the wrong hand, Davy," laughed the gentleman. My mother drew my right hand forward, but I was resolved for my former reason not to give it him, and I did not. I gave him the other, and he shook it heartily and said I was a brave fellow and went away. Peggotty, who had not said a word or moved a finger, secured the fastenings instantly, and we all went into the parlor. My mother, contrary to her usual habit, instead of coming to the elbow chair by the fire, remained at the other end of the room and sat singing to herself. I fell asleep. When I half awoke, I found Peggotty and my mother both in tears and both talking. Not such a one as this, Mr. Copperfield, would have liked, said Peggotty. That I say, and that I swear. Good heavens, cried my mother, you'll drive me mad. Was ever any poor girl so ill-used by her servants as I am? 
Why do I do myself the injustice of calling myself a girl? Have I never been married, Peg Peggotty? God knows you have, ma'am, returned Peggotty. Then how can you dare, said my mother. You know I don't mean how can you dare, Peggotty, but how can you have the heart to make be so uncomfortable and say such bitter things to me when you are well aware that I haven't out of this place a single friend to turn to? The more's the reason, returned Peggotty, for saying that it won't do, no, this won't do, no. No price could make it do, no. I thought Peggotty would have thrown the candlestick away. She was so emphatic about it. And my dear boy, cried my mother, coming to, to the elbow chair in which I was and caressing me, my own little Davy, you know as well as I do, that on his account last quarter, I wouldn't buy myself a new parasol, though that old green one is frayed the whole way up and the fringe is perfectly mangy. You know it is, Peggotty. You can't deny it. Then turning affectionately to me with her cheek against mine, am I a naughty mamma to you, Davy? Am I a nasty, cruel, selfish, bad mamma? Say I am, my child. Say yes, dear boy. And Peggotty will love you, and Peggotty's love is a great deal better than mine, Davy. I don't love you at all, do I? At this we all fell a-crying together. I think I was the loudest of the party. But I am sure we were all sincere about it. We went to bed greatly dejected. Whether it was the following Sunday when I saw the gentleman again, or whether there was any greater lapse of time before he reappeared, there he was in church, and he walked home with us afterward. He came in, too, to look at the famous geranium we had in the parlor window. It did not appear to me that he took much notice of it, but before he went, he asked my mother to give him a bit of the blossom. She begged him to choose it for himself, but he refused to do that. I could not understand why, so she plucked it for him and gave it into his hand. He said he would never, never part with it any more, and I thought he must be quite a fool not to know that it would fall to pieces in a day or two. Gradually I became used to seeing the gentleman with the black whiskers. I liked him no better than at first, and had the same uneasy jealousy of him. He had that kind of shallow black eye. I want a better word to express an eye that has no depth in it, to be looked into, which seems from some peculiarity of light, to be disfigured for a moment at a time by a cast, a squareness about the lower part of his face, and the dotted indication of a strong black beard. He shaved close every day, reminded me of the waxwork that had traveled into our neighborhood some half a year before. This, his regular eyebrows, and the rich white and black and brown of his complexion confound his complexion and his memory, made me think him, in spite of my misgivings, a very handsome man. I have no doubt that my poor mother thought him so, too. One evening, when my mother was out as before, Peggotty was... Peggotty, after looking at me several times and opening her mouth as if she were going to speak without doing it, which I thought was merely gaping, or I should have been rather alarmed, said coaxingly, Master Davy, how should you like to go along with me and spend a fortnight at my brother's in Yarmouth? Would that be a treat? Is your brother an agreeable man, Peggotty? I inquired, provisionally. Oh, what an agreeable man he is, cried Peggotty, holding up her hands. Then there's the sea, and the boats, and the ships, and the fishermen, and the beach, and Anne to play with. Peggotty meant her nephew Ham, mentioned in my first chapter, but she spoke of him as a morsel of English grammar. The day soon came for our going. It touches me nearly now, although I tell it lightly to recollect how eager I was to leave my happy home, to think how little I suspected what I could leave forever. And that is the end of chapter two.